There we go. Hey, Sonia. Can you see me, Melissa, or is it too bright in here? No, I can see you. You're good. Okay. What's up? I don't think she is. Hey. Hey. Uh, you, you hear, hear us? us? There we go. Whoa, whoa, what's up, man? Ooh, How's it going? Like perfect. I, is that good? I yeah. I thought we were going to get you in the car. You've, you've got your setup. Yeah, I'm That's in the awesome. studio. That's why the earlier better, because we probably won't have to leave here until about noon. So gotcha. this would have been, this is perfect. So I can do this. Awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah. I got a haircut um, yesterday you think and I she cut my hair too short. Uh-oh. <laughs> I need a better backdrop. Good. Now that I'm seeing right? your backdrop, I need to like do something in here. A little fancy. Right. This is my little studio where I make, yeah. make I the it. magic. I love <laughs> it. Well, this is Allie. Allie. Yeah, nice to hey, meet you. Nice to meet you, Sonia. Hi. You as well. Thanks um, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's been a crazy uh, couple of it's been a crazy couple months anyway but um yeah so i'm glad we got to make this happen finally uh, do you, absolutely do you, is, is home base atlanta for you sonia nashville is where i'm at oh okay yeah. got it yeah. yeah but you're gonna be here tonight or yeah we're um i'm gonna play i'll be playing at eddie's attic tonight awesome so uh yeah i'm just getting my little levels how's all how's right. the sound yeah how does she the sound like through all right it's shockingly perfect. Oh, yeah. Like I wonder, perfect. yeah, like it's you two are the exact same levels and okay. perfect. Okay. Awesome. Good. Okay, perfect. Yeah. All right, then. Cool. Well, are you we... rolling on the audio board yet or? Yeah, we're rolling on my end. Okay, cool. Um, you yep. want to kick it off, Alan? Yeah. Welcome to the Lesbian Chronicles, where we Welcome have a kick-ass to kick guest today. We right. do. We have an awesome guest, Sonia Lee, who I met, had the pleasure of meeting uh, last fall and going on the Melissa Etheridge cruise with. Um, I kind of uh, hitchhiked a ride with Marina and, uh, <laughs> and it was a blast. So Sonia, thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. It's great to be here finally. We tried to work this out for a while I know. now. So yeah, we really, right we after the Right after the cruise, Melissa was like, I think we might be able to get Sonia Lee to come on our show. And I was like, really? That, that rocks. Um, oh, dude. Before she went on the cruise, I have the um, distinction of saying that they, had, you know, they were, hadn't been dating that long. And I gave Melissa the advice that I'm like, you do not need to be going on a cruise with this babe you just met. Cruise I'm like, this sounds <laughs> insane. I would never be doing that. I said, let me be the one to tell you you're making a mistake. Go if you want. But you're making a mistake. But clearly, I was wrong. Oh my God, they were like the lovebirds of the whole boat. <laughs> they Literally, they are. were making out the entire time. It's <laughs> hilarious. Actually, Nancy Wilson's assistant, she like messaged me on Instagram, and she was like, "We were watching you guys the whole time, and just like they are so in love, and like yeah. they thought we'd been together for like months." I'm like, "No, we'd literally been together for a month at that point." <laughs> So <laughs> that's we why you look so in love, skulls, right? Right. Like, <laughs> but yeah, so far so good. Seven months. Well, out, so. you know what? Good for you. Congratulations. I think you guys are a beautiful couple and I'm really, really happy for, you know, you know, Marina, obviously, cause I've known her pretty much my whole entire life almost. And oh, wow. she deserves somebody amazing and Aww. it seems like you're pretty dope. So um, thank you. That means um, a lot. It's cool. And I think, it's, but I so, fell in love. So now right. I'm the, now we're that couple. I know. I know. <laughs> we're like all over each other all the time. And oh, yeah. you guys are really cute. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm Sonia, happy how did for you, you in meet, that How did you meet your girlfriend? Well, uh, so I, on the Melissa Etheridge cruise, I was, uh, you know, I, she has a breast cancer foundation called Libby's Foundation. And um, every year I, I try to donate a house concert for them to auction off, you know? And mm -hmm. I, I did this year. I didn't, actually, they didn't approach me to to donate one on the cruise. And I was meeting, um, I was meeting with them and I was, uh, I was like, oh, wait, you guys uh, didn't ask, you know, if you wanted, do you want any a bundle or anything or a concert again this year? She's like, we didn't want to take advantage of you. You know, I was like, no, man, I love 
doing this, you know? So it almost didn't happen because they didn't ask me to. I approached them, was like, I'd love to donate, you know, do it again if y'all want me to. I don't want to push the, (laughs) hey, you know? Um, But yeah, so I, I, I donated a concert and they did a silent auction and apparently the very first night of the cruise I played a show remember that by the full deck and yeah. Adia was there and saw me and um was hell bent on capturing me from that moment but she didn't come and say hello to me at all the whole cruise I never saw oh her God. never what? met her but she <laughs> she's pretty smart she auctioned she won the auction when she oh, saw nice. that she's she's back there somewhere oh my <laughs> god this is like a um a romantic yeah comedy or something you and know I'm like thinking about how this cruise is like the love boat and you, right but yeah. I, I think it's funny though that she didn't approach you and like that's yeah. exactly what nancy wilson's assistant said she's like i wanted to because like nancy wanted to give me uh, an autograph picture because of a an instagram story that i posted and no she was way. like yeah and she was like so the assistant Man. was like so intimidated like didn't want to like come over to me and marina so um, there she is yeah. oh hey hi <laughs> we're talking about you darling oh <laughs> i love and, that and she lives out like in oh. hawaii right yeah we're talking about you oh, okay i was just in the studio <laughs> oh, she, all right she's on a lyme disease um she's watching a a um live stream about live lyme disease they're having live performances and panels and stuff and we just got back from Mexico battling. She's been battling a Lyme disease bout. So we went to a treatment center. We literally just got back a couple of days ago. Wow. Wow. Um, but yeah, Mexico. she does live in Hawaii, but now she's going to move to Nashville because. I love it. But yeah, it's been a very fast moving thing. She got really sick and I was in LA shooting a video and we had to, I literally had to leave LA fly to Northern California and get her because she couldn't fly by herself. She couldn't walk. Oh, yeah. She lost control of her legs. And Lyme disease is like, I didn't know anything about how serious and messed up it is to get treatment. Um, not to like hijack this podcast. No, go for it. No, yeah, um, I do. I want to start um, doing some awareness um, campaigns and doing some concerts to raise money because insurance doesn't cover any treatment or tests. America doesn't really recognize Lyme as a real disease, but it's it's a whole thing. You just have to look into it. It's incredible. Yeah, and it's I'm, the fastest growing autoimmune d- disease, and and it's, it's outbeating cancer now. Diagnosed. Wow! Wow! Yeah, I've That's never insane. knew that. Well, I know that Mexico? it's very debilitating. So, uh, because okay. Mexico does uh, alternative treatments, okay. and and they won't they recognize it and they'll run the panels and tests. Um, in America, if they do test you for Lyme, it's like this general test that really isn't as accurate. Um, she, I've been learning so much information about this in the past couple of months that um, I always have to double check the facts because there's a lot of terms being thrown around and I don't want to be incorrect on things. But this one particular test, um, bad. <laughs> What's the name of the test? The Lyme test? Um, PCR test. PCR test. That's what oh, you have okay. to get. That one does an okay. accurate reading. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'll go down and rabbit hole. <laughs> well, anyway. that's great, though. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, I hate that she's going through that, but right. that's awesome that you're there to support her. And it sounds like you are in yeah. a good spot with someone. So that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, um, I love that. Were you single for a long time before that, Sonia? Uh, actually, no. And I was planning on being single. I was on that boat with my blinders on. I did not want to meet <laughs> anyone. I was coming out of a breakup. I was pretty devastated about, and I was like, I don't want to want anyone. I don't want to miss right. anyone. I want this all to be about me. And I don't want to, you know, I just want to work on myself. I just really was not at all wanting to meet anyone. So I didn't even <laughs> have my feelers out at all. But yeah, so that happened. That's Meanwhile, you're surrounded by lesbians. I've never seen anything <laughs> like it. It was I know, insane. So many. So it was exciting. so fun though. Like such a good, like positive vibe and so yeah. such good music. Like yeah, yeah. If anyone's, I think next year the the things on an island or something, which sounds way more my speed than being on a boat for six days. But um, oh yeah, Are you guys gonna go? 
I don't think so. I, I would like to, but it's, it falls on the weekend of my son's birthday, but it was just so cool too, to see you guys collaborate. I mean, you got to play with like these amazing artists, Melissa Etheridge and like, it was Katie, just tons of, yeah. So yeah, cool. <laughs> she actually played in Hawaii. What well, before all this stuff happened and I was out there and we went for Valentine's day um a day at and we went and saw katie and she put us on the list oh nice really cool. yeah. <laughs> very cool in honolulu very cool um <laughs> so as, as you know our podcast is about coming out later uh and we like to hear people's stories of when they came out no matter how when. old they were when so, or, yeah exactly uh let's hear it what's your what's your story um hmm. uh okay so you know, kept coming out as a gradual thing, obviously, like, so when you say coming out, it's like the first person you came out to or to your friends or when the whole entire, yeah, like kind of when you, you know, realized, got yeah. busted and, and open. when you realized or, and when, and when you kind of started to, to open up and <laughs> that's that the stage like, making were you out with my friends. You were always um, making out with your friends. Oh, I, I was actually, uh, I was, I was totally making, I would like, I should probably go to jail maybe because I was like always <laughs> tricking my little girlfriends into making out with me, you know, like when I was That's a kid. That's hilarious. Like, like, how old are we soap talking? Opera? I mean, I was third grade. My yeah. next door neighbor, Susie, I'm not going to say her last name just for, I used to, uh, we used to play um, soap so opera. So we, we'd like, like we were doing a daytime smart. television show. That is smart. <laughs> that's, right. that, that's smart. I, I'm impressed by the, I had the slyness day. there. I got a right? lot of action. You had up. game in the third grade. I got a lot of action. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But so um so that I I mean, but I don't know. I just guess I didn't really know if I was gay or not. I don't think I knew what it was really. I don't know. Um but I always had crushes on girls and things. I think when the moment that I really realized, cause like I used to be writing songs for girls and stuff once I learned how to play guitar and I was like writing all these songs for these girls in my high school. And like, you know, <laughs> I had a crush on one of my stepmom's friends who used to come over, this older woman. I was always into older women back then. But um, uh, yeah, um, but, I had my first, oh, so I was really struggling with it for a long time though. Once I, when I found out I was in seventh grade, that was when I realized, oh, cause there was a girl in my school that I always had a crush on, but I wasn't really, didn't understand. Yeah, I didn't really pin it down. I don't know how, why it was so obvious. Um, but I think that we were doing like a, um, like a in history or creative writing class, we were doing a reenactment of some story. And I got paired with her to like, as a couple that was in the um, story and I had to dress up like a guy and I had to like walk her into, and I about fell out of my chair because I, you know, I'd had this crush on her and we we're all in the bathroom at, and, you know, I was always very uncomfortable changing and stuff in PE and stuff. I always felt really shy about my body. I'm so very shy about my body, but that's, oh, it's changed a lot. But um, I don't, I don't know if this is all TMI. There's um, no but, such thing uh, as TMI. On right. TMI. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I accidentally saw her boob while she was changing and I went straight into the bathroom stall and I like was like, so embarrassed I remember like feeling my face flush it wasn't like sexual for me I was just like and then I for some reason in that, that moment yeah. right for some reason in that moment I was like oh shit I'm gay like mm -hmm. I'm actually you know but I, I came out grade. as bi yeah okay yeah I find that really really like I remember in like middle school you know like having to change in the locker room I I hated it. I, I was too. like, yeah. I did not want anybody to see me. I I had yeah. like, I would not look. I didn't want to look else. at anybody because yeah. I didn't think I was looking at them. And it's right. like, it, that's one of those things that was Depressed. like one of my gay, my gay Easter eggs that I kind of realized a couple of years ago. I was like, that's so gay. Like who, 
you know, like, why was I like that? And it's, I know because other wow, girls weren't, they, they, right. They didn't yeah, care. Just like flopping around everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I still <laughs> feel that way. way at the gym. Like, I feel like these women, like I'm still a little that way in the locker room. Oh, yeah. Like if I'm yeah. changing and these women are like naked in front of the mirror, getting ready at the gym. I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, you're full out <laughs> just like away. getting ready in here. Like put a towel yeah. on. Uh, yeah. It's, well, you it's know, my like, thing. Before, it's my yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. It's my yeah. shit. Yeah. It's my shit. When right. we were in Mexico, it's also like they have like saunas and, you know, hot tubs and stuff. And there's a one, women's spa part and a men's spa part. And Aria was getting one of her treatments. And I was like, oh, I'll go sit in the sauna while I'm waiting. And I walk in and the showers don't have, they're like tiled, but they don't have clothes. And one of the women, was like flat out butt yeah. ass naked like and I yeah. saw her and our eyes met and I looked down and I oh, left sorry. the spa and I was <laughs> like because she because because then I would have to go into the sauna area and I was like oh because me and Aria were I mean we were like the couple of the whole treatment center because of course you know we're it was scary time we were very affectionate and stuff so, so everybody knew who was I ended up playing a concert there while I was there it's crazy. Uh-huh. But um, yeah, so I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable, you know, and so I left. But then I was like arguing with myself. I'm like, why do I feel like I don't deserve to be in there? Right. You know, I was like felt to myself, like, why don't I feel like I don't I don't deserve to be in this room just because I'm gay? Like yeah. if this might be her shit and she might not even be thinking that, do you know what I mean? But she it, probably it really started a conversation in my head about what we feel as gay women in amongst you know other women who aren't in situations like that it's like right is it shame is it yeah Yeah, is it shame yeah yeah. right that's really interesting yeah i've never really thought about that but i i i feel that a lot being when i'm in the suburbs you know it's like there's just something where it's like am i supposed to be here like walking around and being like outwardly gay like it just yeah. feels weird sometimes. Yeah. So, or is it like your own homophobia? Well, right, exactly. I, I think it's I, like internalized, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, weird. Um, but, I, but I did. I went straight back to like high school and, and locker room days. Right. Yeah. Um, I relate to that. So, where did you go from there? Like, did you like did you come out at that time? Like, did it take oh, a no. few years? Uh, no, I struggled with it for a lot longer because like I was raised Pentecostal family. Like my dad wasn't really practicing that religion at the time he was. Uh, and, but, you know, my grandparents and I was raised to believe that you know, I was going to hell. And so I did a lot of like praying and crying and just trying to like, you know, figure out what's wrong with me, make it go away, make it go Pray away. Pray the gay away. Then at the same time, I was still like crushing on, you know, women and stuff. And ironically, I was learning how to play guitar. And around that time, I did meet my first gay person who was a friend of my stepmom's. And of course I had a crush on her. And about that time was when Yes I Am came out and she introduced me to Melissa's music. She was like, you need to, I ended up coming out to her she was like one of the oh. first people I came my my little sister first because we shared room. her and my brother were the first people I told and, and with your stepmom is your you were close to your stepmom obviously if you're spending time with two of her like where she was a good I don't know role model or she was important in your life uh well she was um her and my you know my dad played music so when they would have friends over uh, they would have me come out and play, you know, music and stuff when they were all hanging out. So, you know, I, I was kind of always hanging out with them and their friends, you know, and um, even at a young age, you know, so, um, you know, Closure. I think she was, without giving too much information, I, I think she was a lot more open-minded, um, and I think she knew. Um, oh. I did come out to her later. Um she was probably the next person in my family, but that was, we moved away to, to Indiana. And that was when I was amongst a lot more people were open and I kind of came out at school as 
by and you know had my first girlfriend went through a breakup and that's when I told my stepmom about that but then we moved the big come out happened she you know I told my stepmom she was like it's just a phase don't tell your dad it'll pass I I went through that when I was young you know um but I knew that by that point that you know that wasn't a phase you know and um right. Yeah, so, um, but I had written a friend back home in South Georgia, which was really, really small minded school. And uh, I came out to her. And then two years after leaving my junior year, we moved back to the same town. And um, I had, had so much growth and exposure to open minded people and just different mindsets that. Um, it was devastating for me to have to go back to that because I felt I'd outgrown that first in so many where, ways. Where in Indiana, I'm from Indiana, so I'm curious, born and raised in Indiana, and I don't think of Indiana as being super progressive, but I guess it is when you compare it to Georgia. South Georgia? What? County Jordan, sorry. Um, well, Carmel, Indiana, Carmel High School. Oh, wow. Is where okay, I you were so and, close um, to where so I was. So it was a bigger high school. Where, where are you from? I'm from Indianapolis. There, remember, remember where the are you from? minute 21. Oh, yeah. It's breaking up a little bit at 21. Um, I'm from, yeah, Indianapolis, okay. but I went to Catholic school all the way through. So I had a very religious upbringing in Indianapolis, but Carmel is where. I mean, you were probably five minutes from where I grew up. And I was to hang out in Broad Ripple. Yeah, that's where I lived, like post college. Um, and Broad Ripple is, I mean, that's very progressive. But would you, are you guys having trouble with like, is it breaking up for you, Melissa? You're breaking up a little bit on, on my end. Like just that feels better. Are you at home, Allie? Yeah, I don't. Our my internet in here is usually awesome, but I don't know what's going on. Okay, can we go back to where we were? Um, um, so we're, we're, we're back to where she said where she grew up yeah just so that, that we can have it be continuous oh okay yeah so I mean I moved around a whole bunch of but where I moved from Pike County Georgia to Carmel Indiana wow okay In and my, so to, you grade. Carmel is more progressive because Carmel is like a um pretty oh upper upper echelon suburb it would be like alpharetta in atlanta so it's yeah. surprising i mean it just shows like the midwest is i guess a little more progressive than the south but i mean south georgia like that place it's like still 20 years behind right now like, right i can't imagine going down there right now and like holding hands or being affectionate or any like doing anything outwardly gay like i'd be terrified Right. Yeah, so. down you know where my dad lives is it's uh, Molina, Georgia. Actually, it's like right near Thomaston, and then and the next town over is Macon. So, you know, that's all still very un untouched mostly. You know, like I was just there recently and drove by my old school and like the same little um, restaurant where everybody used to skip school and go into and get busted. I don't know why they always went there. <laughs> I knew that that was went to school, <laughs> but that's there and everything. But um, yeah. So um, you know, when I was in in Carmel, like there was so many so many reasons why I loved that that high school because I did come from the small town. They had a lot of you know, I took psychology there. I took yeah. uh, piano and keyboarding and music theory. I was in the um, I don't know um. 
can't, what, can't remember what it was called. I was trying to get into radio and television. Broadcasting. Nice. So that was kind of my, you know, uh, it was just so many, so many options. They had a hockey team and swim team and wrestling team, things that just, just a lot of things that were not offered back home. So on top of, you know, you know, the, the eclectic group of people there and, you know, and you're also moving into, you know, if you look at racism and homophobia, it was a lot, you know, and in Carmel, you know, there wasn't, you didn't, you didn't see a lot of race yeah. there, but there weren't as many eclectic backgrounds in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I can, anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. That's not <laughs> part of the story. <laughs> but I, I, written, I've, I had written a friend back home and came out to her and she apparently had told people, which that news spreads fast. So then when I moved back, you know, in a, when I walked into the high school, of course, it was like everyone and I also looked like a deadhead because my hair had grown all the way down to my ass. Oh my God. I wrap, you know, I looked totally different from anyone there because people were still wearing tapered jeans. And <laughs> <laughs> it's like Did you, you, you had gay? traveled to the future like, and then you had look, to go back to the past. This was the nineties. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> everybody yeah. looked gay in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Grunge. 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 Yeah. You know, the baggy jeans. Flannel shirt, but not at this school. Not at this school. Not yeah, at right. School. It was it, still like what, well, like yeah. eight eighty-seven at your school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why did y'all move back? Like, why would you like Carmel oh. and Southern Georgia? These are like two different universes. It was totally, and you know, I was so upset. Um, but my it was my dad's job. You know. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um. So you know, I. I hadn't really decided that I wanted to, my parents, you know, I told my stepmom, but I hadn't really came out to my dad, you know, and um, it had not been discussed. I really don't know how they didn't know, to be fair, but um, I actually thought that, that they did, he did like, you know, um, but so I kind of got forced out because that whole thing happened. So when I was at school, people were always talking to me, asking me if I was gay, you know, it, it was harassment at some points from certain yeah. groups of people. Um, but in my head at that point, I had already decided that, I will, that this might sound really uh, I probably shouldn't say that because I don't no, want to say it for sure. I just felt like they were, they were just uneducated and yeah. I was not as advanced and hadn't been exposed to things that I had been exposed. So I was like, they're all stupid. Basically. I, I didn't mean, take right. it to heart. It didn't really bother me, but you know, deep down somewhere it did, you know? Um, but so that kind of bled that like rumor and everything. And then people would ask me, you know, are you gay? And I would say, yes, we, you know, oh. I actually said, I prefer women. I don't like la labels, you know, mm -hmm. because I, that's a way, you know, I was just, I think love is love and you don't choose who you love. And, but that could, that kind of rumor bled to my younger siblings schools. And apparently they were asking them about me and that got back to my stepmom and I came home from school one day and she was like, why are you telling everybody you're gay? And I'm like, I'm not They're They're telling me I didn't, you know, I didn't do this, you know, and um, it, it, it ended up going pretty south because, you know, we had an argument. She was like, why are you telling them? I was like, they're asking me and I'm not going to lie, you know, right. and so that would kind of got into a heated argument. And um, then my dad came home and it just really kind of got ugly and, and blew up. And, um, you know, things of over time, my parents, you know, kind of we've been through the whole they had to get, you know, adjusted to that. But and it wasn't a pretty sight when I, I didn't have a great coming out story. I ended up leaving home, had to quit school and um, mm. get a job and start a band and but my music career started happening and things like that. But I think um, it's true. Like maybe that's the silver lining. It's just like when you have these adversities, it does 
like give you a hunger um, that just there's no plan B. Like I've, plan A is going to work because there is no yeah. other option for me. That's exactly um, true. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm curious around whether the guitar, like you were said you were learning guitar at this point. Is that like I... I have like a skill set right after a really hard time in my life that kind of gave me, it didn't give me arrogance, but it gave me a confidence to like, okay, you guys think whatever you want. I, I can do this. Was it ever like the guitar is like, okay, screw you. You have no idea this little ace in my pocket that I'm about to play. Okay. And right. the guitar. Yeah. You know, you're right. My music became my, my, it was always my, where I disappeared and, and expressed myself when I was even, you know, dealing with my sexuality, like writing, I wrote so much. And, um, you know, I was, I was different from everybody. I didn't really go to the, all the girls sleepovers and things like that and wasn't invited to all those parties and things coming up. So I would, it's like, I always felt like I never really fit in with the boys and all the way and, fit in with the girls all the way. I was like, I could hang out with the boys and do everything, but of course guys want to go do guy time. Girls, same thing. I had friends, but when it was like girl time, I wasn't considered girl time girl. You know what I mean? So yeah. I had a lonely place that I had to go to, to, um, you know, comfort myself and um, that kind of like weirdo feeling that I always walked with, where do I really fit in, you know? Right. But it let yeah. you master your craft. I mean, it gave you the time and the space to master yeah. your craft. Yeah. I mean, honestly, all those days uh, that was, and I could, I could play every, uh, every song on Yes, I Am. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And that was before the computer. I had to rewind the tape, press play, listen to it, figure out the chord, rewind, write out the lyrics. You know? Holy shit. Wow. I think she actually printed her lyrics and her tapes. This is, we're talking tapes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. Like I, I, that's funny. Cause I, I taught myself how to play like minimal guitar when I was in like seventh, eighth grade, but I was buying like the guitar magazines uh, um, and just learning whatever yeah. tab they had in the back, nice, you know, nice. but to listen to a song and figure it out, like that's impressive. Like you've obviously got a natural talent there. Natural well, talent and the time, the, I mean, it's the, the silver lining of being alienated. And I mean, what a gift in the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It is a powerful gift. And so that's, that's, that's a good point. And I think it's, it's interesting too, you know, kind of like what happened with your coming out and like, you know, not being fully accepted by your family. That's the fear that so many of us that came out later had. Yeah. And like, you know, it's kind of like if, if I had led on to anything that I was going to be like truly myself as a teenager, it's not safe, you know, like right. those are the situations that everyone's trying to avoid. And sometimes they're just like unavoidable. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's what happened. But what I did, um, what I went through paved the way I think for my family to learn and start to really accept it as it's not a phase like this is who I am because now through all the years you know without going into how many years and how old I am um you know like my my father has went through like a lot of acceptance and you know no what I I've said to people who I mean I've dated women in the past who weren't out and struggled with trying to figure out how to go through that process and stayed in the closet and it's like the jump sometimes it's not going to be pretty but it'll never you'll never get through that process if you don't start it you know and you going into it coming out understanding that maybe you won't get the response that you want but granting grace and time for the other people in your life to process it and have their reactions, whether it's right or wrong, like the reactions that I got were selfish, but it was also not about me. It was him processing what that meant to him as a father, mm -hmm. you know, and I didn't understand that, you know, and um, 
it takes time for things to come around. Sometimes it never will. Sometimes it actually time does, you know, and you have to be an example and continue to just like walk in your truth and show your family and people around you that, you know, what kind of person you are, you know. I like, I like what you said too about like, you have to, I call it moving the chains, but it's like, even if you're just taking one tiny step forward toward, you know, it might take them years, it might take them minutes, but as long as you are still continuing to kind of move the chains in the direction of your authenticity or whatever you want to call it. I like that. Cause I think so many people just stay stuck. And to me, that's where the pain is. It's like, if you can just keep moving, even if it's one little yeah. thing you're going to do, tell somebody or I don't know. Um, yeah. That's a good approach. And to me, just like, as you guys know, once you get that secret off your chest, it's almost like there's such a weight lifted that, you know, the people around you and their reactions, it's horrible, but it's worth that burden off your spirit, right? Absolutely. Didn't you feel free in, in whatever reactions that came suck to go through, but it was like, a strength that you gained by freeing up your voice mm -hmm. to be able to handle those reactions, you know, cause like, you're like, <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, there's a strength in saying how you actually feel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then that, that weight that comes off of you, like for me, it, that weight was lifted. I thought it was going to be lifted. Like when I finally finished coming out to everybody, but it was lifted when I came out to my parents, that was, yeah. And, yeah. And it was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't know that was like, what was so heavy in this, you know? Yeah. Um, and once I, once I came out to my parents, it was kind of like, oh, I've got this, you know? Yeah. yeah. They so. were the scary monster and now yeah. I can do anything. I'm yeah. curious what both of you would say about when I was first coming out, I had this catalyst and it was like very volatile and she had a lot of friends that she would introduce me to. And many of them I felt were um, broken is the wrong word, but like very, had a lot of baggage from childhood and a lot of, they were in their, you know, thirties and forties, but these women felt to me scary because they all seemed broken is the only way I can use to describe it. Like just, un, they were the sadness among the, her friends that I was just like, is everybody in this population, like suffering in some way. And it scared me. And then I remember someone telling me that like a lot of these women came up in the seventies and eighties and they weren't accepted as children. And now here you're seeing these adults with the, the scars that come when you're older, that here's what it looks like. And I remember thinking, Oh my God, that's terrible. Like, is that going to be, these are my new friends and everybody's got some horrible thing. And I just, I, I have, I don't know, I'm seeing a lot of healthier women now, <laughs> But in that moment, I remember even expressing to Melissa, like this population of women feels so damaged. Like, what the hell? Um, what would you say about that? Like, do you, do you see that in your gay friends or from who came up in the 80s? I, no, yeah, I think you're right. I think that it was a lot more difficult and a lot less support coming out and had, had to do that, that. What I, I said this in an interview a while back but about country music, being gay and country music. And I was saying that it's all about what you're exposed to. People are afraid of what they don't know. Okay. So um, sexuality and all the way it's progressed and how open it's becoming, especially with youth more so now, it's becoming people being exposed to things more. So it's right. becoming more common and people are adjusted to it. Back then it wasn't that way. So it was, a, you know, less exposure, of course, with, you know, different repercussions, you know. Um, so of course there's a lot more damage, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, now it's, there's a lot more support. I think that people, True. it's becoming more common for people who are homophobic and not supportive to be the minority now. Yeah. I think that that's growing, you know, and, and it's just going to keep growing because now I feel that there's just been a wildfire started as far as, you know, in, uh, in all kinds of areas, not just in, sorry, I don't know if that's me, um, in all kinds of areas. Um, and I mean, you can get into how 
quickly that spreads because social media and more access to information and you know television programs with openly gay characters now and just just so much things are becoming more common to where it's not so taboo to see two women like it was just on a commercial you know what I mean yeah it's not so covered up anymore but right. back then yeah it was supposed to be covered up so yeah I agree that yeah, there's a lot more damage around the older generation but it, if it hadn't have been for people who taking those leaps it wouldn't be common absolutely now. true so it's, just right. all, it's just more people coming out is what created and paved the way for it to become you know an option. How do you feel like compared to when you first started getting into music, did you feel more so like you had to be hidden um, as far as like your sexuality um, compared to like how you can be now? Um, I never, I think that once that whole coming out thing happened with uh, my parents, I didn't, I never wanted to come, go back in the closet. I wouldn't lie just for music, no. Mm -hmm. uh, I never hid it I did not lean upon it there was a difference in what my angle was as a musician I didn't want to be labeled a lesbian musician that wasn't mm -hmm. my angle I wanted to be respected as a writer songwriter and an artist um, in my own right and yeah. um, my sexuality is like it's a very big important part of me and I'd never avoided questions or interviews or anything like that. I played pride festivals and stuff, but I just didn't only only focus on that market. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I had to like make sure I was not attaching that as to my full identity. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well and it's it's like but it's worked. You it. know, you mm -hmm. you like you said you didn't rely on that and it's worked. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we'll see, whatever. You're doing <laughs> awesome. Yeah, uh, for sure. And t talk a little bit about like your, um, you've got a residency with Eddie's Attic right now, right? So oh uh, yeah, yeah, let's hear about uh, that. So when I was coming up, you know, I left home and stuff and I moved, uh, ended up making my way to Atlanta and Eddie's Attic was one of the first stages that I stepped on in Atlanta and I wasn't even old enough to be in there. I was playing Eddie's when I was 17 and it was owned by Eddie Owen back then, who's now um, got his own place in, I think Duluth called Eddie's Presents, but um, I, I've been playing Eddie's for a long time. A lot of people got their start there. John Mayer, Ani DeFranco's played there, Sugarland, um, just loads of people come through it and it's a very... It's one of my favorite venues, and so I'm doing a residency there um, every month up through uh, July, and I'm oh, and I'm bringing different artists. I love to bring talent with me that I know and believe in and love. And tonight, actually playing in Indicator at is and bringing Boys Club for Girls. They're an, they're a Nashville band, but one of the girls, Vanessa, and I used to be in a band. She's from Atlanta. We've known each other since I was 19. And um, we used to be in a band called Butterfly Stitch. We used to play around Atlanta with another girl called Jen Lowe. And we played Eddie's a lot. So it's going to be a fun, fun uh, residency with a lot of great music every month. So it's just the top. Yeah. Well, and that was just it on the cruise. You, you had your crew with you. And she'd have these people up on stage and then all of a sudden be like, Holy, take it. And she's like, yeah. what? Like, she'd go <laughs> Wait, for it. Wait, me? So cool. Exactly. Like, she's like lifting up these like young artists, you know? Oh, that's like, amazing. I think that's really, that's really cool of you to be like a mentor to these people and, and share your time on stage. Like a lot of people can't do that. A lot of people are like, it's all me, 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 me. And you're right. not like that at all. So. Well, it's important, I think, to do that because it was done for me. It's important to me to make sure. And I just have a big mouth. When I'm excited about music, <laughs> I want other people to hear it. So, you know, it's just, it's more fun that way, man. It was, it's yeah, well, always yeah. such a blast to be sharing, you know, this time with, with other people that you love and believe in. Absolutely. Right? And uh, I love when people get to the top, when they turn around and pull the other person up. Like, I, it's like that to me is like you're, you're clearly confident in yourself. Like if you can help someone else, you're in a position to help someone else. I, that's, I always admire that because it's easy for people just to not stick their neck out. It's far easier actually. 
Yeah, I've seen it. You know, I've I've seen both sides of that. So yeah. Now one of the the best parts I thought of the cruise was that I kept walking by one of your friends' rooms, and they had a flyer outside that said the Indica Girls. <laughs> And like I kept hearing about the Indica girls. Indica, Indica girls are playing. Indica, Indica girls. And I'm like, I'm who are the Indica girls? Yeah, and, RLG. and Sonia comes out with her friend on stage, and I'm like, Sonia's the Indica girl. <laughs> I had no idea. I'd walk by this fire so many times, and it had your photo <laughs> on it. Like, you literally didn't know. Although in my in my defense and in Marina's defense, we were delirious the entire time because we had those like anti nausea patches on. Oh, so shit. we, our brains were about like a quarter Half speed. Math. To, like we we literally thought there was one elevator bank in that entire ship, and at the end of the trip, we realized there was three. <laughs> like we're idiots. So, but I love the Indica Girls. I think it's hilarious. Uh, if you want to explain your take on on what your genre is with that oh, one okay okay so in the cook girls um so i i i've always loved rapping and hip-hop and writing raps and i finally decided i was going to try to like start making beats and stuff i built a little studio here in my little house and um started making tracks and one of my best friends um her name is naomi but i call it 24 7 uh, she moved in here and then the pandemic hit. And so I just started messing around engineering and then we'd, we'd get high and start writing raps and stuff. And, um, you know, I rap under the name 1111 and I, I have other projects that are coming out. I have a project called Tiger Tiger that's coming out. I'll do it with Daphne Willis, that EP is coming out where I'm actually now rapping and stuff. And I never was like confident in, oh, I'm just a white girl, you know, like, no, but but so we just started this like little fun thing. And we were like, <laughs> because it was, it started as like a duo thing with me in 24 seven and a joke. Cause we just get high and just talk shit, you know? And like, <laughs> just with no agenda, just like two friends. It's probably like y'all's podcast getting together. Like <laughs> we're going to just talk shit on this podcast, and see right. we want, you know? And um, with no, like, we don't care if we offend anybody or we get, and you know, a big and famous or whatever. And then, then we started inviting our friends to come who like would, would never think about rapping. We're like, dude, just rap and we'll put it under a different, we'll make you an Indica girl name, you know? <laughs> and so we featured a bunch of different people on our tracks and, um, you know, we just, it's just hip hop. Uh, it's, it's like low five nineties hip hop. You know, yeah, I think let me that's tell what you. I like about it. It's a little 90s vibe. Yeah, so. We don't take ourselves too seriously. Let me do we a shameless, a shameless. I'm sorry. Shameless plug. My partner is like a crazily good beatboxer. Like it is like she does it so much, I think out of habit now that she's like mastered it. I mean, we'll be at parties and people are like, Maria, like beatbox. And like, you don't expect her to be able to do it. So if you ever need a beatboxer, I got oh. one for you. Bring it on. Okay. That would be cool. amazing. And we live in Decatur, it. so we're going to definitely come see you at Eddie's. Oh, please come. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Tell her to get up and beat box. There yes. You <laughs> That's awesome. We did. I had Indica Girls. We played there the last time. And uh, out of nowhere, I started beatboxing because we just were playing on guitar. We usually have tracks. And I just started beatboxing over the song. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not a great beatboxer though so yeah let's have a chat about that that's that awesome sounds good I love yeah it. she's really good like it's just like you look over and you're like wait what <laughs> <laughs> I have never seen this and now I am very intrigued <laughs> it's, a, so. it's a party trick <laughs> I love it I love it yep well, yeah. all right Sonia we won't steal any more of your time and yeah. you gotta get on the road and get to Atlanta but, yeah, well, thank uh, you so much thank you we appreciate you Thank you for letting me join your cruise and being such an awesome friend of Marina too. So, of course, man, of course. And uh, good luck to you guys. And thanks for having me. Nice to meet you, Allie. You too, and, uh, Sonia. We'll see you at Eddie's. We'll be there. You're going to come. Okay, cool. I'll yeah. put y'all on the list. Then. Thank you All so right. much. All right. All right. See Bye. Ya. Peace. Bye. Bye.